Seven o'clock. So, welcome to our first meeting uh, meeting for the year 2020. If we could get a roll call, Chloe. Commissioner Ruth. Here. Commissioner um, Newman. Here. Commissioner Christensen. Here. Commissioner Welch. Here. Chair Welch. Here. Thank you. And now we'll do the uh, pledge of allegiance. Very good. So this meeting is cable cast live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T U-verse Channel 99. It's being recorded to be replayed on the following Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Uh, the meetings also can be viewed from the city's website at www.cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Kingston Rivera. And with that, if you just would uh, help us by putting your phones on silent, that would uh, that be great so they're not interrupted during the meeting. <laughs> so to start off, we're going to uh, write in the, our new business. Uh, we elect a new chair in January, so I guess I'll take a motion for chairperson. I nominate Ed Newman. Okay, so we have a nomination of Ed, who is our current vice chair. I second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. There we go. So I can move and <coughs> add to the. <laughs> Thank you. And I want to, uh, before we elect the vice chair, Thank you. just uh, I've done this before. We've had this rotation, and I'll say it again that it's very difficult to follow. Chairman Welch because <laughs> he has a unique ability to run these meetings to uh, afford the public a uh, great opportunity to participate in the meetings and still keep them moving along and I'll do the best I can to do the same but uh, as I say it's a, they're hard shoes to fill thank you thank for your you. service okay you. so uh, next item of business is we need to uh, elect a vice chair in the event that I'm disqualified or I'm unable to make a meeting I don't know how the other two we have two newer members um, Mick has done this a number of times in the past so I would nominate Mick to start out unless there's someone else that feels like they're ready to jump into it I'll second Okay, any other nominations? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So next. Yeah, I just want my chair back. That's really my chair. <laughs> <laughs> the next uh, uh, item of business under oral communications is any additions or deletions to the agenda? There are not. Okay. Then next is uh, the opportunity for public comment. This is the time for anyone to address the Planning Commission on anything that is not on the agenda. And as I say, which I hope has some relevance to what planning commissioners do. <laughs> Hi, Sheree McCoy here. I hope the Capitola Mall redevelopment is relevant. Definitely. Thank you. <laughs> Tiny Capitola is already on the map, a charming place known for its wharf, beaches, shopping, restaurants, and a multitude of successful events like the Art and Wine Festival. We can leverage the fact that tourists are already interested in coming to Capitola. The mall redevelopment should take advantage of this interest and expand our amazing destination spot by enriching the dining and shopping experiences of tourists and locals alike. A recent study was conducted to ensure that the mall project is fiscally self-sufficient. The resulting numbers indicate that because of the increased cost the city must pay, pay to provide services such as police and schools for the proposed 637 living units, it actually offsets the revenue that Capitola would receive from the residential housing taxes. Other folks have commented that there are plenty of other locations for affordable housing projects within Capitola. Losing the precious mall property space to residential use would be a travesty. The mall rede redevelopment is a potent opportunity 
for creating an extension of the village. It can be a vibrant location for people to meet and gather and spend their money within our city limits. The proposed residential towers are a staggering 85 feet when our existing restrictions are 40 feet high. The proposal also specifies that the setbacks shrink from our established rules. Why would we stray from our laws just because a property owner wants to make more money with housing? Would we change the street speed limit from 25 miles per hour to 40 just because someone filled out an application? Much of the proposed amenities and green space are strictly for new residents when it should be for all mall patrons at the mall. The high density housing plan calls for 1100 car spaces. These car spaces should be anticipated for hungry and thirsty shoppers who want to spend their money at the mall. The housing factor should be removed from the plan and a hotel put in its place. Keep in mind the Community Development Department mission statement includes to preserve Capitola's unique cultural and historic character. Please work with Merlone Geyer team so that the proposal is reflective of the look and feel and the needs of Capitola. The well-being of Capitola is a priority over the return on investment from any developer. I'm Sheree McCoy, and I <coughs> approve this message. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I think, as what we've already mentioned, there'll be plenty of opportunities down the road to address this project as it uh, is processed. Anyone else? If not, uh, commissioner comments? No. So I had one, which was to uh, see if there is any update on the um, gross sign violations of Mattress Firm on 41st? Um, I, I do know that we've received a code enforcement complaint and are moving forward on that. Um, I do not w know exactly where it is, whether or not um, where it is in the process, but I, I can reach out and provide you with an update to the council. Uh, or to the yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody has approached them at all from the officialdom to explain to them that you can't have six uh, sidewalk signs out there. And I mean, uh, even before we go through a formal process, maybe they just aren't aware that we have rules here. Now, this is sort of an annual thing with them. So they, uh, we spoke about this at our planning huddle this week, um, and they've definitely had another violation and I think within the last year so they are well aware of the regulations and so I think we'll probably move straight to a citation with this because um, they've been spoken to before I, I still have pictures on my phone of it from last year so yeah so we've been pretty tough on people on 41st who've come in for sign applications and it's really not fair to them to put them through all the expense and the limitations when someone just uh, blatantly disregards our rules anyway so there, there is a pending letter that will be going out. Great, thank <coughs> you. Any, uh, anything else? Any staff comments? Yes, um, I did want to make you aware that our we applied for an SB two grant. Um, SB two uh, grants were open to all municipalities and counties, and this was towards a, the housing effort. So any um, real estate transaction that takes place, there's now a seventy five dollar fee which goes towards SB two towards um, Housing and so the first round of grants was really to help jurisdictions bring their codes up to par and help with anything that will help fast track housing development. Um, back in November, we submitted an application and it was for um, helping create uh, pre-approved ADUs that would actually fit within Capitola lots. Um, and also to help with, there's a SB 35 is a separate um, regulations to help streamline permits and, and development permits can no longer be under SB 35 looked under subjective criteria such as compatibility and privacy. Um, it has to be, you have to have objective standards. So we'd also use the money to update our code to create objective standards, which along a property line you could limit or suggest a certain amount of windows and separation and the heights of the, those windows as a 
something for privacy. But so we were notified last Friday that our <coughs> application was accepted and that we've preliminary approval. Um, we applied for $160,000. So um, I haven't gotten the amount for which we've been approved yet, but I'm hoping it's for the full amount. So I'll give you an update once I know more about the amount and once <coughs> the action is official, but we've gotten the preliminary approval. So that that's great news for the city. Um, and that's it. A actually, one more update, just because the Capitol Mall just came up. We do not have an application yet, but I am expecting one within the next two weeks. Great. And I think we'll come back to the housing uh, issue later on yes. in the agenda here. Uh, next is approval of the minutes uh, from uh, the regular meeting of December 5, 2019. I move approval. Second. Second. Any uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, none. That passes. That takes us to our public hearings. We have three public hearings. The first one is 1591 Prospect. This is a fence permit with the location exception and major revocable encroachment permit for a wall in the public right of way located within the R1 single family residential zoning district. Staff report, please. Good evening, Commissioners. Chair Newman. So the application before you is uh, for 1591 Prospect. It's uh, to construct a fence and privacy screens which will encroach in the public right of way. The property is located at 1591 Prospect Avenue within the single family residential zoning district. The proposal includes a major revocable encroachment permit and an exception to the fence height standards which both require planning commission review. This is a continuation of the December 5th, 2019 planning commission meeting staff has since conferred with the city attorney regarding encroachment permit questions posed by the commission which are addressed later in the presentation uh, the lot is on the corner of prospect avenue or and lincoln avenue within the jewel box neighborhood and is surrounded by one and two-story single-family home above the property and fence as it appears today the existing fence is aligned with the approximate property boundary Above are the locations of the proposed encroachments. The pink dash line is showing the property boundary there. The proposed wall in red to the left uh, would be made of plastered concrete blocks and has a maximum height of 42 inches. The privacy screens shown in blue will consist of wooden posts and slats for a maximum height of five and a half feet. The proposed wall and privacy screen elevations above uh, the Planning Commission must evaluate major revocable encroachment permits using the following considerations. The expense and difficulty that will be entailed in removing the improvements in the event of street widening. Whether the proposed improvements are in conformity with the size, scale, and aesthetics of the surrounding neighborhood. The preservation of views and whether granting the permit would tend to result in the granting of a special privilege. These considerations were analyzed in the staff report and no conflict was found. During the December 5th, 2019 Planning Commission meeting, the Commission requested input from the City Attorney regarding encroachment permits. Question one posed by the Commission was whether the encroachment permit could become private property over time. State law prohibits the ability of public property to ripen into title against any public agency. It has been similarly addressed in California courts which have decided that the encroachments, that encroachments may not be acquired by prescription against the City. Question two posed by the Planning Commission was whether an encroachment permit granted an exclusive use right to the permittee within the enclosed area. The Municipal Code suggests that areas with a public right of way obstructed by any improvement or object through the encroachment permit process becomes private space. However, should the owner at any point in time refuse access to the improved area by city staff or utilities, or should the encroachment become a public ish access issue, the city has the ability to revoke the permit as mentioned in the previous slide. The applicant is also requesting an exception to the fence location. Corner lot fences are required to be set back at least five feet from the property line on that side of the lot which has the greatest length along the street, which in this case would be Lincoln Avenue. 
the pink line shown above represents the property boundary and the green line represents the five foot setback. The areas in red uh, near the top and the bottom indicate portions of the wall and privacy screen that enter into the required five foot setback. The applicant is also requesting to remove two trees along the proposed wall. The red circles indicate trees proposed for removal and the green circles uh, indicate trees to remain. Although there are trees, although these trees are in the public right of way, they are adjacent to 1591 Prospect Avenue and therefore consider the responsibility of the owners to maintain. The owners may likewise request the removal of the abutting trees with proper findings for removal, such as a development application. The two trees are along the proposed route of the encroaching wall, which is why the applicant has requested the removal of these trees. With that, staff recommends that the Planning Commission review and improve the encroaching permit, fence permit, and tree removals based on the conditions of approval and findings. Any questions of the staff? I had one question about the, the uh, map, page one of the plans. I was very confused by the Prospect Avenue location. And maybe it's the name of the streets. If you look on the location map at the upper corner of the plans, we've got Prospect parallel to Lincoln. So, and they've got the portion of it is parallel till it makes yeah, the turn. Yeah. Yeah, that should yeah. be it. So why does it say Soquel Wharf there, road? That's down below down the hill. Yeah, it's, it's confusing how it looks. All right, yeah. so I'll just stay confused on uh, that. No, I know he's yeah, cause <laughs> actually pro that is prospect because of the high school or so. Yeah. Anyway, I, figured I just wasted a lot of time trying <laughs> to figure out the maps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so if there are no other questions of staff, uh, this is a public hearing. Uh, is the applicant present? Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Pedro Rosado, architect. I also represent the uh, owners in this matter. Um, <clears throat> and has been reviewed by staff at the previous hearing. Uh, concern <coughs> of the commission was granting approval of the encroachment, which would give owners the exclusive use of uh, city property and increase uh, the value of their property. Um, our understanding of the revocable uh, encroachment permit is that the city maintains ownership, there is no transfer of title, and the city has a right to make uh, any modifications or revoke uh, the permit, uh, regardless of what kind of improvements the, uh, uh, the owner has made. Um, <coughs> and similar projects have been uh, approved by this commission in the past. Um, one is to the neighbor, the neighbor to the west, um, their wall encroaches is an encroachment um, and they have uh, the wall five feet from the uh, uh, from the street curb another uh, <coughs> project with a wall encroachment was improved uh, july <coughs> was approved july 2019 at uh, 511 escalona drive uh, and another previously uh, was approved at 210 Central Avenue uh, in previous years. We realize that although a precedence uh, has been set, approvals uh, for encroachments are on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the owners are asking for approval of this project so that they can enjoy occasional use of the outdoors in a, in a semi-private uh, setting. The, <coughs> the setbacks uh, on the site on the south side of the uh, the property are three feet wide. That's hardly any uh, space at all for uh, uh, for being able to sit outside and enjoy the uh, um, uh, enjoy the weather uh, or do anything. And on the <coughs> on the west side is also there. Might, there's probably around 90 square feet of uh, of area in there. So the only the only area uh, usable is on the uh, north side. Uh, 
which is along Lincoln Avenue. Um, <coughs> this northwest corner is the only area on the property open for outdoor use uh, with minimal traffic and not blocked from, uh, from the sun by the canopy of trees, uh, the oak tree taking up uh, half, approximately half of that. We have reviewed the staff report. Uh, we agree with the proposed conditions of approval and we hope that the commission finds in favor of uh, this request. Uh, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, any questions for Mr. Rosato? No. No. Thank you. Anyone else from the public care to address this item? If not, uh, commissioner comments? I move staff uh, recommendation. With the appropriate findings? Yeah. With the appropriate yeah. findings. Second. Okay. Uh, before we vote, I'm going to explain my no vote. Okay. On this, just I I, um, I I heard the commissioner's thoughts on this last time, so I'm aware of what the outcome of this vote is likely to be. But I just want to say that I'm going to oppose it because I don't think it's a good idea for the city to be giving what is in fact the exclusive use of an area of property to a private citizen and he's basically they're putting up a wall there and taking that section of the property for their own use and it would be naive of us to think that this will ever not be ever be re reclaimed by the city or that if the city attempted to reclaim it it would go down easily without lawyers and whatnot so um, I think if the city wants to give away property it should make an equal gift to all citizens of Capitola. And we'll now uh, have a roll call vote. Um, Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Welch? Aye. Commissioner Christensen? No. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. And Chair Newman? No. No. So that passes. Three to two. And the next item. is uh, Br Bromer Street improvements, which I can, uh, I'm just surprised there aren't more people here to <laughs> participate in this uh, public hearing. <laughs> Staff report, please. I, po I posted lots of notices all <laughs> up and down that segment. <laughs> so. okay. The city of Capitola, do you want me to wait? No, you can go ahead. Okay. City of Capitol is it, applying. It's multitasking. Uh, City of Capitol is applying for a coastal development permit for roadway improvements on Bromer Street. The improvements include a new sidewalk on the north side of Bromer Street, new striping with Class Two bike lanes, and roadway repaving. Above one of the cross sections for the proposed improvements. Sidewalk and driveway widths vary between the cross sections, but the layout is consistent. Proposed roadway improvements with car lanes and bike lanes along Bromer Street, curb, gutter, sidewalk, and driveways on the north side of Bromer Street, and parking, curb, gutter, sidewalk, and driveways on the south side of Bromer Street. So this would be facing east towards 41st Avenue. The sidewalk along the northern side of Bromer Street is currently incomplete. The city is proposing to add new sidewalk to, cre to create a safer route for pedestrians connecting 38th Avenue and 41st Avenue. The Bromer Street and 41st Avenue intersection seen here. Uh, new to the intersection is a median curb and a green bike box. The bike box is painted is a painted ex bicycle exclusive zone to increase bicyclist safety at stoplights and during intersection crossings. The Bremer Street Improvements Project has been in the Capital Improvement Program CIP since 2012. The current project limits were initially established in 2012, but the final design was not completed until funding was secured in the form of Measure D allocation and the Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission Regional Surface Transportation Program Exchange allocation in November 2018. 
The proposed sidewalk and bike lane improvements create a safer means for the public to access the coast and recreational opportunities in Capitola and Santa Cruz County, consistent with the purpose of the local coastal plan. The proposed project complies with the required findings of a coastal development permit. And with that, staff recommends the Planning Commission review and approve the coastal development permit based on the conditions and approval, conditions of approval and findings. We have uh, Kailash here tonight as a representative of Public Works if you have questions. I have one, Ed. <coughs> does, does the median strip extend beyond the driveway for the new Timberworks building? So would prohibit them from making a left turn into it off Bromer? So to address that question, Commissioner, the, the intention of that median strip uh, being lengthened and may be made out of concrete as it is now, it's, they're just bollards. And the, the primary um, concern that was voiced to us from the residents that live on that street was that oftentimes we have people who are trying to go to that uh, the hotel and they make a right turn onto Bromer and then realize that they needed to continue and turn in later and they'll cut across right there, make a left turn in front of that. And so that creates a very dangerous driving condition and lots of near misses have happened. And so that was extended to prevent those drivers from making that maneuver. Um, as far as the timber works, I do, I do not think that it goes beyond there because as it is right now, the those cones are, are, I think the limit of the cones as they are right now still end before that property. Mm -hmm. And so they might be close, but that, he, he's, he's seen these plans quite a few times, so that was never, that issue was never raised. Okay. The uh, corner property right here where the mouse is, that's 4025 Romer Street, so this is the Timberworks property. Okay. Yeah, this is driveway, and right here is the end of the curb, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> I guess this is a public hearing, and uh, you are representing the city of Capitola? That's correct. Okay, do you have anything further to add? So yeah, I guess I'd like to add that maybe to address why your question is why we don't have more uh, members of the public here is we did have a public um, workshop on this project and I think the, the majority of the residents that had the, the greatest impact to them are those that d currently do not have sidewalk in front of their house. So all of those residents we've been in pretty good coordination with on trying to make sure that we're aligning things in a way that allows them to still maximize the use of their property. It's it, the situation here is that many of those residents have been there since this Bromer was most, mostly a residential street and over time the industrial and kind of different uses have come into play and so they're somewhat tucked, you know, it's a residential, it's partially residential and partially commercial and, you know, visitor serving with the hotel. So we're, we're, we're trying to be as uh, accommodating as we could to those residents who are losing on-street parking right there. And as a result, we've tried to maximize their driveway approaches to allow them to still be able to, to you know, utilize their residence as they do today. I gather we got no written uh, concerns from any of the residents. Uh. I think some of the residents are here today if they had any comments. Okay, we, we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, um, good. And then, yeah, I guess the other thing we would like to add is this is, you know, for the most part, we've received a lot of pub, uh, positive input from this. Um, we've been coordinating with the Regional Transportation Commission because a large part of the funding is coming from them. So we met with their um, elderly and disabled technical advisory committee as well as their bicycle advisory committee. They provided some input on, on the project, uh, trying to make some modifications to improve the utility for both the public in the form of uh, vehicles, pedestrians, and bicyclists, so I, I believe that we've come to a point where we've really tried to maximize the utility of this project for all three modes of transportation along Bromer Street. And we're excited to have this built. It's a, it's a street that many people, we get a lot of complaints about Bromer needing uh, attention, and so usually we're able to tell them that we're in the plans of able to have something completed hopefully this coming year. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this is something that we get to see uh, materialize in the, next, in the upcoming months. Do you have a time frame? Uh, so, you know, after this meeting, we're, we're, we're ready to go out to bid on this project. So our goal is to bid this project now um, and then, you know, upcoming months with construction happening <coughs> early summer and be, be finished before the fall. Good. 
It's one of the worst streets in the city. Yeah, the 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 uh, the co the score that that street gets is I think in the teens, which is out of a hundred, so it's pretty poor. <laughs> okay, let's hear from. Thank you. Let's hear from some of the members of the public. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Bart Hochstater. Uh, I'm not really good at public speaking, but. Um, Anyway, uh, I'm one of the residents on the north side of Bromer. I actually live next to the west of the new Timberworks building. Uh, I'm losing my parking. I've thrown the flood. The, I'm good with that. I've started reconfiguring so I can park off street. Uh, my main issues are with the safety of Bromer. Uh, you just said it's one of the worst streets in Santa Cruz. Uh, the speeds that are reached from 38th Avenue to 41st <coughs> for people to make that green light reach 60 miles an hour easily sometimes. Um, I think the other residents could attest to that. Uh, that being said, I had brought up in the meeting at the hotel about speed bumps and was told that it's an arterial road. We cannot put speed bumps in it. <coughs> that being said, I sure would like to see something being done for safety on this road. Um, it's out of hand. <laughs> it's, ri it's, it's ridiculous. Um, so if we can't put speed bumps because we've been all of a sudden designated a truck route, uh, every house on that road is a residence except for the new hotel. So we're a residential street. People don't look at it that way, but we are. And I don't feel like we have much of a, of a say on what goes on there. So if we don't get speed bumps, we need some kind of traffic study done between 4 o'clock in the afternoon till 6.30 at night on Monday through Friday, and you'll see how insane people are. <clears throat> it's pretty crazy. I just had a cat run over, you know, three months ago. And, you know, cats are roaming, so whatever. You guys don't care about that. But nevertheless, it is not a safe street for the residents pulling out, pulling in, irregardless. Um, the ballers that... Uh, Kalish spoke about they're not ballers they're plastic strips people run over them to get in the hotel they uh, they clog up traffic um, it's it's just you know they're gonna extend the medium I'm happy to see that um, it, it's needed um, the other thing I wanted to address was um, the fact that Bromer's a truck route I don't see with us being residents, except for the hotel, why designate, who designated Bromer as a truck route? We have Capitola Road. Well, then we were told, oh, the trucks can't make the turn on, on Capitola Road, but yet they can turn onto our road, taking a ride off of 41st going west towards 38th to make the loop into save, uh, well, it's now it's Lucky's Orchard and so forth. Um, once again, we're the stepchild of it. We get, we, we're designated the truck route. Why? You've got Capitola Road. Portola is more commercial than Bromer is. So that's a question that I definitely uh, wonder about. Um, the south side of Bromer, we have a uh, retention pond, I will call it, which has a, an approach for county vehicles, city vehicles, whatever, to go into that retention I totally understand that the fact that it's I've never seen it used by anyone from the city or county whoever addresses that retention pond parking is at such a premium we've lost the parking on 38th when they did did the bike lane I believe on the west side so now parking on the south side is being used by not only the residents of Bromer but some of them on 38th not to mention the people from New Leaf the hotel, we, our parking situation on Bromer, w we were told during this kickoff meeting at the hotel, oh, well, you can't have a residence only permit. The Coastal Commission got rid of that in 74. Raposa has a residence only parking permit. I guess they got that in 74. So, you know, I'm not trying to whine here, but there are several issues on Bromer that I think safety wise need to be addressed. And I feel like it's <clears throat> it's just been you know too bad so sad deal with it, and the, and you know 38th 41st is a problem area between the stop sign people see that light go green, and they'll hit 60. I guarantee you. 
So I don't think any of you folks would want to deal with that living on a street that you lived on. Um, so I'm hoping at least do a traffic study during the heavy commute time, 4 to 6, 6.30. You'll see. It'll speak for itself. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? And Kalish has been very helpful, by the way. I didn't mention that, but he worked with me. He ran out on my property several times. Um, I have no issues with that. So I'm Mark, and this is Krista. And we live uh, right next to the hotel, right, right next to it. And, uh, on Windward Lane. On Windward Lane, little subdivision there. And um, yeah, our whole issue like Bart said, is with public safety because we've lived there for 21 years. And so I do, I've done a traffic study for 21 years. Every time I pull out of our subdivision, the sight distance that we need to be able to navigate out and, and avoid a collision with a car coming from um, 41st onto Bromer going north and then the cars come from 38th, it, it's a crapshoot because we don't have enough with parked cars that are coming forward at the speed, rate of speed. It, it's really a crapshoot. You pull out and you go, this is the best I can do, and you come out and then you go, oh, shoot, you know, and you back up, and so it, it's really difficult. So I saw the improvements that were done on Jade Street with the speed table, and I have to confess that I was one of those guys that would gun it down Jade Street when I saw a green light. I, I would be halfway down and go, I think I can make it home. <laughs> and the light was green and I was one of those guys. But when they put those speed tables in, I became a calmer driver. <laughs> I obeyed the speed limit and I got home safely. And so it really translated into something that was effective. I looked at it and I went, you know, that's just what we need. And so I didn't understand why <coughs> that wasn't part of the plan and why it, why it can't be part of the plan because- Speed test, yeah. yeah. The speed, yeah, and more so the speed table, it's a longer, you know, it's not as abrupt, it's not as hard in the vehicles. And so I think that would solve a lot of Bart's and my concern because I was doing some landscaping the other day and I was out there for about four or five hours in, on our landscape within our subdivision and I like Bart said I was amazed at how fast cars go by there even county trucks with the emblem going you know and making trying to make that turn on a 41st I said this is crazy and and your car get didn't your truck get hit my truck was actually Wait, hit and run yeah okay so the way we do this is that yeah. you speak to the commission oh I'm sorry at the microphone and then Okay, <laughs> so, um, but anyway, I, I think it's a real reasonable thing and we're not trying to bellyache, but I'm more concerned about the safety. We got grandkids too and a lot of family visits and it's, it's our main concern and I feel if the plan doesn't really address that part of it, um, it's a real concern. It's, and I think, I don't wanna blame this on the Waze app on my iPhone but we've got a lot of increased traffic in the last two years that use Bromer. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's my concern. I think it should be part of the plan. So thank you. Thank you. And also um, that subdivision on Windward Lane was um, built in uh, 1999 and they put a keep clear um, uh, painted lines so we could pull out or when we're pulling into our subdivision from Bromer um, so so if there was traffic backed up we could just pull right in and out I just wanted to make sure that that was repainted again because it's getting uh, pretty worn and I know you know if I have to stop to and you know usually the traffic's backed up probably for I don't know, half the block, especially during um, traffic, um, the traffic hours. 
that um, that could really, if I had to stop to wait to make a left turn into um, Windward Lane, that could back up traffic on 41st and everything. So just wanted to make sure that that um, keep clear was um, repainted again as it was originally was. And like my husband said too, you know, about we have to pull almost halfway into the street before we can even see right or left to make sure a car doesn't hit us. And um, yeah, it's, it's a, just a continuous problem. And it's probably gotten a lot worse in the last 10 years since the hotel's been there. I mean, we're fine with the hotel, that's been great. But there is a lot more traffic now. And um, even just hearing the first lady come up and talking about the new 637 units that may go into Capitola where the mall is, you know, where's all that traffic gonna go to? I mean, it's really gonna impact our neighborhood. So we really appreciate your consideration for our safety and everything. Mark and I have lived in Capitola for 45 years and we love our home and, you know, we just wanna keep the essence of Capitola like it's been. And uh, we appreciate that, thank you. Thank you. Is there a red zone on either side of your entrance to prohibit there cars is, from parking real close to it? There is on both sides, but it doesn't, it went out far enough probably 10 years ago and then someone painted gray paint uh, over uh, the Just red, a homeowner. Painted yeah. gray paint over the red. <laughs> so it really shortened it up about a car length, but that's the, that's the amount of space we needed so we, we can see down the road. Mark, th see thanks, Mark, but uh, get out and leave. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just want to rejoin. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so someone painted over the red strip, they painted over with gray paint, and it took probably one and a half car lengths away. And, and when that red strip was there, you know, the full red strip as it originally was, that gave us enough. Um, areas to where we could see the traffic, you know, coming forward. Now it's pretty much blind. So that's the gentleman you should talk to about getting that red <laughs> curb back where Actually, it should we be. Have, <laughs> our, our daughter and son-in-law also live in one of the six homes on Windward, and I know Alicia has been in contact with you through email and probably phone conversations quite a few times, so. You know, we just want to work with everyone, and we so appreciate you hearing our voice. Okay, thank you. We'll be thankful <coughs> the Bromer Street Broadway connection never happened. Otherwise, <laughs> it would really be a lot of traffic. If you've been here yeah. 45 years, you remember when that was being discussed. True. <laughs> so, um, anyone else from the public? I don't see anyone. So, um, Mr. Mozumder, do you, you care to respond to anything that's been said? I know you were being interrupted there for a while. You couldn't hear what was going on, but... No, I, I, I think I, I got the gist of most of the comments, and, and these a lot of these have been raised over the course of the project, e either at the public meeting that we had and then subsequently since then. Um, so I think I'll start with the, do you have the, can you pull up just the striping plan, uh, Sean? I think one of the slides shows, I thought we had stuck it in there, maybe not. No. No, okay, then that last one with the, <laughs> the one with the green is fine. So. Um, so p partially, the, it's not that we designated this as a truck route, it just by default turned into that. So what ends up happening is uh, delivery trucks coming down 41st that feed into the um, uh, parking lot that, that has Lucky's, Osh, and, and uh, that, that er area. They can't make a left turn back out onto 41st, 41st from that parking lot. So they end up going down south, further south on 41st. And this is the last street I think that they can make a right turn on. And so they just, it just become the, the default truck route. And they go, so they make a right turn here, they go to 38th and they go back and then get back on 41st and, and leave. So it's just kind of the loop that they take. And uh, as a result, um, we'd, we had had the uh, utility pole there hit a num numerous times over the years. And so part of the, of the project is actually pulling the, the width of the lane, the, east, the westbound lane is a little bit wider at the opening of, at 41st than it is currently. And it shrinks the size of the eastbound lane um, on Bromer heading towards 41st. 
Um, so that what we're, our thought there is that that will we'll have lower risk of having big trucks strike the utility pole there. And then in addition, that squeezes the size of that lane on the exiting Bromer onto 41st. So really um, in practice, we, there's no longer the ability for a, a right turning car to squeeze by a car that's either queued to go straight or left. And so we're, you know, with that, there's, there's maybe going to be a little bit less of the kind of uh, haste of people trying to get through because if there's one car there that's not making a right turn, or as it is now, you can squeeze through. And so driving behavior may be modified. The other um, aspect that we're doing with, with updating the striping and increasing the size of the striping for the bike lane will actually reduce the path of travel slightly for the vehicles. And, and our traffic engineers tell us that, you know, there's a moderate, um, maybe measurable reduction in speed when you reduce the lane of travel. But as far as being able to implement the, the speed table idea, we did look at that, but the designation of this street, which is not designated by the city, but by Caltrans, which designates the streets as arterial collector, um, was, is, has that designation. And so what we've been advised is it, implementing sp speed bumps, speed tables on a street that has that designation isn't compatible. And so that's why we didn't move forward with trying to incorporate that into this project. We did, we did uh, have a few traffic studies uh, points taken. We didn't do a full evaluation as far as, um, you know, morning, day, and evening t uh, speeds and volume. But we do have some uh, one 24-hour count, and we'll, we'll be getting another count because the police department's actually updating their, their inventory of the city. So we'll have a little bit extra data on this, but what the data does show is that you do have pretty, uh, you have the occasional very fast driver. Um, and I think the average speed is a little bit above what the posted speed is. Um, that, that isn't outside of the norm for some of our other streets in Capitola, but it is an issue. Um, so as far as being able to reduce the speeds on that street, there, there weren't a, a ton of options that we, we're able to incorporate into this. Our, our hope is that with having the designated um, lanes on both the north and south side that are, are much harder to see right now, the, the whole roadway will, uh, will, as a driver, will appear a little narrower and potentially will have lower uh, speeds with that. With, uh, with improving the bike lane and making that a little bit more visible, our, our hope there is also that it'll have that same effect. Um, what, what other questions? Oh, so the red curb length. That is something that, so we're trying to make, we tried to come up to a happy medium there because the length of that red curb also eliminates on-street parking. And with this project, we're already eliminating, I think we estimated about eight or nine on-street parking spots. So that red curb length as they exit windward, I think has fluctuated in length over, over the years. And, and I don't know the history as far as what the, if there was ever like a, a set length that we needed to have it at. As far as our, our, our standard uh, specs that we use for exiting, for, you know, for cur driveways that exit onto streets, we're, we're not short of what the kind of required distance is, but that's fairly short. I mean, if you've driven in, you know, cities like San Francisco, you can see where they have, you know, they'll have eight feet or 10 feet only. I think we've got, I don't, I think it was up to 45 feet at one point, and I think <coughs> now it's around 20 feet of, of red curb, um, so that was trying to strike a balance of, of uh, understanding they have that challenge of, of exiting onto the street with the people driving too fast, but also trying to accommodate parking at the same time. Let me ask you a question here. Do you think that uh, further traffic study would be beneficial in terms of whether or not to go ahead with the project as designed? I don't think we'd see anything different. I mean, if we saw faster speeds or we saw more volume, it, there's not, a, there isn't really more that we can do with the layout of the way the street is as it is to incorporate something new. It, it, the, there really isn't any other options that we thought about that we eliminated because of something or that we would bring into play because of a traffic study. Peter, did you have? Well, yeah, a couple questions. Uh, so I was confused, the, the red curb. So that means you're increasing it or decreasing it? No, so it right now the, the plan is to keep it as is and we're not, we're not changing it, but it has fluctuated over time. So that's independent of this project. The striping of the curbs isn't really. And the keep clear thing, uh, repainting is also independent of this? Uh, what keep clear? So Driving from windward to 
for 21 years there's been a decrease kind of um, yeah. in cases. Oh, okay. In the, so on, like actually in the road itself? Yes, okay. Road. You can see it from Google Maps. Oh, okay. Um, and we don't have that in there now? It's just, I don't know if you have it in your plan. Okay. But it's still there. I have it. It hasn't been reviewed. Uh, okay. okay, guys. So one of the reasons we do this in an orderly fashion is because there are people who watch this at home okay. and people who watch it later on, and they can't understand what's going on if people are just having a workshop. And Kalish, you can see it from uh, oh, yeah, Google Maps. It's I do have the updated striping plan, and it, it, that keep clear is going to be updated, so that will be refreshed and, and thermo striping. Okay. Any other questions? So, but getting back to that red thing, red stripe. So you're saying that if you were to increase it at all, you would lose a parking space, and that would yeah. that would create all kinds of havoc well, from other neighbors. I mean, so is it's yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> roughly that's true. Anyone else? Thank you. So I think we've covered. Okay. Um, <laughs> for a second, if you can come back up and address us again briefly. We missed Dean okay. already. Pardon? No, I'm right. <laughs> I've already run into trouble, haven't I? Um, so, like you know, we've lived there for 21 years. It was a new subdivision, yeah, a so new road. Okay. I don't want so you to repeat things that you've already told us, okay? Okay. Because I already knew that you lived there 21 years. Okay, sorry. So the initial red curb, when they um, put in the subdivision, everything was 45 feet. Now, and then, um, so it's been maintained that, and then someone, some homeowner came by and painted the gray curb so they could get more parking and now it's 20 feet now it's 20 feet so it's been reduced almost half and that's created a, you know a problem for not being able to to see before you pull out so now we're having to pull out almost halfway into the lane in order to make a safe left hand turn so that's the problem and you know, it's great that we're having all this new um, roadways designed and everything, but if it's not safe for the residents and the homeowners, I mean, that should be number one, you know, safety. So the fact that um, he's saying that the traffic is, you know, going a little bit over the speed limit, well, that hasn't been our, any of the neighbors' observations, you know. it's it's mind-boggling how fast these cars go and um, it's just unsafe you know I mean you, you should put Capitol Police out there they'd make a fortune writing tickets and pretty maybe short, that would pretty help short too. stretch though for enforcement that's the problem <laughs> oh. <But> oh. <laughs> <laughs> these guys are out of control this is my first city council meeting okay, thank so I'm you. sorry thank you for your input this and uh, all right uh, Take it back to the commission, and there's a lot of food for thought here. <laughs> I think the improvements are long overdue. I don't have any solutions as to what to do about the speed. We're not going to be able to do anything about the traffic in the trucks. Uh, I just, I, I just don't see how you solve that problem. I mean, we could toss it to staff, but I'm not sure what kind of solutions they'd come up with. But I support the improvements. Yeah, I, I know that. This Bromer project has been on the books for a long, long time because I would talk to Steve Jesberg about Fanmar improvements, and he says, "Oh, you're right behind Bromer." <laughs> that was many years ago. <laughs> so I know this has been in the works a long time. I know there's been a lot of community outreach. I know the city <coughs> council has talked about this in the past, uh, and I think Kalish addressed all of the questions in terms of safety as best as could be done. I mean, in terms of they considered it, they did what could be done, the improvements need, uh, yeah, I just don't, I appreciate the, uh, the citizens' concerns and safety, of course, is, is, is primary, but I, I don't know if there's a, there's a solution other than police enforcement of some sort. I, you know, it, we have talked about, we went through that whole thing on Jade Street, right, and then we talked about flashing lights and speed tables and bollards, and there was, we got Kimberly Horn involved in endless studies, and 
basically came down to well you could do a speed table and that was it and maybe maybe some signage but we can't do speed tables here so we're you know we're w he, with the narrowing of the lanes and the and the addition of the bike lanes I, I guess that we just have that's the best we can do and I, I just you know if there was a another solution proposed that we could consider I'd I'd be interested in it but I I, I think uh, I think we're in good shape here with this plan as best we can be now uh, this is uh, now if the Commission is going to make some comments now and public hearing has been closed uh, I, you know, I think there may be a couple of thoughts. Listen to Kalishin on the um, <coughs> why the trucks are coming down 41st. Is are they are they they're exiting Kings Plaza? I'm guessing. And if that's the case, then maybe we can work with Kings Plaza to make that loading zone that goes behind Save Mart, whatever that place is now, to go one way from 41st to 38th. So they can't come out on the 41st and make that right turn. And maybe that would force them to. Um, exit on 38th and go north towards uh, uh, Capitola <coughs> and not have to come down 41st south. So, and I, I think uh, Kings Plaza is open to working with the city right now. I think there's some, because of the mall and everything else, they may be open to, to doing that. I, I, that's my guess is why the trucks are coming down there. I don't, I can't see why uh, other trucks would, I see why they're coming down Bromer, uh, coming out of that. Kings Plaza, but if that's it, we can <coughs> maybe work with them to have that a one way so they can't come out. Uh, that may reduce some of the trucks. I think the design in itself will help reduce the speed. Not, it's not going to stop it, obviously. I, I sometimes park my truck out on the street just to make cars slow down because it does narrow it, and people seem to slow down because it, even though we sell a wide street, uh, because I. I I race cars, but I hate speeders on the street. I just, uh, it just drives me crazy. So I'm one of those guys yelling all the time in front of my house. But um, so the design itself, I think, may lend itself to slowing some of those people down. Um, I can see where, actually, from Google Maps, I can see where the gray paint is actually over the red. It's interesting. If you look close enough from the aerial view, you can see where they did. So um, the city, I'm sure, can go back and, and make sure it's the correct distance because that, that is obviously a safety hazard. So I think we can reduce uh, maybe and ha address some of your concerns. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, I don't know how we uh, – enforcement, and we can, we can try to do an enforcement. I can tell you from Topaz and Jade when we put the streets up, they put a <laughs> – a ghost car they call it a police car with nobody in it out there and they had another police car counted I think what they say 90 cars still turned up that street even with the police car there known as illegal turn so um, and, our, and unfortunately our police officers are just you know they, they run a lot of calls believe it or not in a little town so um, but I, I think definitely we can work with the police department to start some enforcement at least out there and, and put a um, you know maybe we could get uh, we know we have the speed you're traveling at this speed and we, c we can at least offer some of those solutions I think but aside from that I think the project is long overdue and and you know since a kid we use Bromer as a thoroughfare it's always been there as a thoroughfare I think with the impact of highway one being uh, with more and more commuters we're seeing it all through Capitola um, and that's the reason why we end up doing the work on Topaz so Bromer's just become another commute lane opposed to Highway 1. That's that's the bottom line, and we're all being impacted by it. So uh, other than that, I, I think, you know, the, it's a good project. So I'm empathetic to your situation. Don't know if we can help, but we can at least throw a couple ideas out there. Commissioner Christensen, any thoughts? Thank you, PJ. Yeah. I, I'm hearing that the project is, is appropriate for the for Bromer but then you have these specific concerns that don't necessarily relate to the project details except for you'd like more interest to be guided in that direction I just how do how do we make it so that that interest actually focuses on the speeders it do, do can we implement anything that well we just have a project in front of us here you know we're not uh, 
philosopher kings. <laughs> okay, so. let's go take information back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Things. I mean, there's Commissioner Ruth. Do you have anything further you want to add? No, I just. I just think if you're hoping this project's going to slow the traffic down, I think the only thing that slows it down right now is the condition of the road, and when the road <laughs> gets improved, it's going to speed traffic up. I, mean, I, I think that's almost a given. So I think our only answer is probably enforcement, but I'm not sure what kind of answer we're going to get on that because it's such a short street. Oh, I think this, uh, this project has obviously brought to the surface a lot of issues you know, that aren't really project specific but they're they have to do with what it's like living on Romer and the traffic and situations that's not different from a lot of other places in capital uh, where people are speeding on Wharf Road and uh, people can't get out of their driveways and these are all concerns and relate to our traffic problems and our driving habits that maybe aren't what they should be but right now what we have before us is just this specific improvement project and it's, I mean, it's good to air some of these concerns and maybe solutions can be found, but in terms of what we're here to do tonight, it's just really to decide whether or not to go ahead with this improvement project. So does anyone care to? I would move approval of the project with the conditions and the findings. I second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 So that, I did have one uh, comment. It seems a little weird to me for the city to make a recommendation on its own application. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so for coastal development permit, so I, I wanted to just if I could, um, for a coastal development permit, it's really about making sure the connectivity to the shore continues to the bay. And the review criteria that we look at for a coastal development permit is really, you know, there's a lot of criteria about um, that keeping that connectivity and but the review is really about mm -hmm. connections to the ocean within the coastal area um, this will go before City Council as well there will be another opportunity for a public hearing and at that stage you know the, this is going to be going out for bid contractors will be looking at it um, I can definitely bring the concerns back to our Public Works director tomorrow and let him know what happened at today's meeting but um, so it's this is for the coastal development permit it still needs to go through the bidding process a contractor uh, get awarded the contract and the city council making the um, passing the contract so they'll have a closer look at the project as well so I just wanted to let you know this isn't the last step there will be another public hearing in front of city council okay well thank you all for your input and uh, we'll move on to the last public hearing item <coughs> which is an update to the zoning ordinance the local coastal plan implementation plan two plans in that <coughs> all right thank you chair newman commissioners give everybody a second to walk around a little bit testing Okay, so tonight we have a uh, zoning <coughs> code update for you. Uh, this is a three-part zoning code update that involves um, a correction, uh, an update, and two separate updates. Uh, this is being brought forward separate from the larger zoning code update of uh, you know all of Title 17 inside the coastal zone. That one we're still working with the Coastal Commission on. This is something that we're trying to uh, get moved forward a little more quickly and expeditiously. Uh, because it's based on things that are actually already in s new state laws of January 1st in the case of ADUs um, or the result of lo recent legal decisions in the case of the signs. So we're trying to just move these forward a little bit faster. So staff is proposing that the uh, maximum residential density limits in the community commercial and regional commercial zoning districts be removed from uh, table. The action would bring the zoning code into conformance with the general plan. Residential and commercial development limits would then be established by the development standards in commercial and mixed use zones. Those standards include floor area ratio, height, setbacks, open space, and parking. Uh, staff is also proposing, uh, sorry, the city attorney has recommended several changes to uh, our sign regulations based on court rulings, as I mentioned before. Those changes include adding language allowing non-commercial content wherever commercial content is allowed 
adding definitions for commercial message, commercial sign, and election period, and adding a section allowing small temporary non-commercial signs on residential property. Uh, if you have uh, any specific questions regarding these or what was in the staff report, uh, the city attorney will be at the next regular meeting uh, so she can answer any of those questions for you. So can you just ask, answer maybe the uh, simple one which on previous slide. So sure. what when you say commercial message, what, what's the issue here? What, wh wh what's the controversy? I believe this had to do with free speech. Um, and uh, the non-commercial message is defined in the new code um, as any message that has no commercial relevance. So, I mean, it can be any you could, statements. You could have, like, any mattress firm save the whales or uh, something yeah. like that. Yeah. A good example that you'll probably be seeing in the near future is we've recently received a application for a conditional use permit for the Takara building and it's going to be a temporary use by a church. So although the church is in a commercial establishment, they can utilize the same s signs and place the name of the church within the signs. I have a question, Ed. Mm -hmm. Is there any connection between eliminating the residential density requirements in the regional commercial zone and the proposed or about to be proposed mall development? No, so to go back on that one, um, what occurred was when we updated the zoning code, we put a 20 units per acre uh, density limit in the code. But in looking back at all of our meetings and when we talked about updating the co uh, community commercial and the regional commercial, there was never a discussion on that being a major change within our zoning code. So we think the density limit was accidentally placed in the code. In, in, the, in the past, it's always been um, dependent on the floor area ratio, height, setbacks. Um, if the Planning Commission feels more comfortable keeping in the 20 units per acre, we, we could do that. We did bring a lot of analysis forward to the Planning Commission and City Council when we updated the general plan talking about if you have a density limit established within these areas, actually they become open to the density bonus um, laws in which if you have a 20 unit per acre, if you bring in a certain amount of affordable housing, we'll say at very low rates, they could get up to a 35% increase in density. Um, so there's different ways to look at it, but really in Capitola parking is one of our most restrictive. Um, development standards and between the floor area ratio and so height. But it was an accident. In how that how the does it impact the proposed mall concept oh. as we currently know with the current language mm -hmm. and how would it impact it if we take that language out? So the current mall is built at 20 units per acre and, and they um, we had guided them to not exceed 20 units per acre because that's the highest density in our multifamily zone. So we said we, we would guide you not to go beyond that to fit within Capitola's highest density. If you were to take that out, um, they would have to, in order to make it more dense, they would have to create more parking within that development. Right now they're over the height limit, so it's really, it, it is going to be a, um, you know, they're, they're asking to go beyond the limits to provide community benefits, so it's a discretionary permit and you have a lot of oversight on what you can, what you'll allow to go beyond height. Um, but they possibly could make it denser, but they'd have to build more parking garages. They've said to us that they have no intention of making it denser. Um, but it becomes but allowable I if we take that out. It does, it could become more dense, but it, it's right now they're beyond the development standards in terms of height as proposed. So they're, they're really asking for this special um, community benefits review rather than a density review. So. But the general plan doesn't have the density in it. So, we're, so you're just trying to make it consistent with what's in the general plan. So we, um, the zoning code added the 20 units per acre, and it had never been in, it bef in, in the zoning code before. The general plan was silent to it, so we recently updated the general plan 
to specify that density is a reflection of the floor area ratio height, the development standards in those zones. So the general plan is up to date with no um, density limits. And now we're within this zoning code change proposing to remove the, the error that was made during the update. I can put a, more analysis and go back to some of the old staff reports in the report for next the next How come meeting. You didn't do the reverse and oh. and update or make sure the general plan followed the zoning ordinances and we updated it. It, like, it was an error that it was placed in there. So that was an error. It was added to the land use table. Thanks. Isn't there another item too? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> a very the, most, big one. the most important one, <laughs> right? <laughs> that some of us have been spending all of but our I'll, time I'll, on. I'll bring more analysis <laughs> in the staff report We're not for the next any meeting. On this tonight, right? No, yeah. no, I'll, I'll bring more analysis back. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so on to the fun part. Uh, there were six bills signed into law in October of 2019 that completely changed the way ADUs uh, or accessory dwelling units, since we're just introducing this now, uh, are processed and approved in all of California. Uh, those changes all went into effect as of January 1st, 2020. Despite the major changes to the government code, the state of California has not provided any guidance to local jurisdictions on how the new law should be interpreted or implemented. Uh, in fact, the most recent information on the California HCD website is actually to the uh, new things as of January 2019. So um, they're a little, <laughs> little behind. <laughs> Staff, uh, however, has been working very closely with the city attorney and with a uh, planning consultant named Ben Noble to uh, draft a new ADU ordinance uh, in the you know, couple of months or month and a half since those uh, bills were signed into law. So what are all these major changes to the ADU laws? Uh, at the very highest level, what they basically do is uh, restrict a jurisdiction's ability to regulate ADUs and junior ADUs. Um, most existing local ADU ordinances, such as ours, will not be consistent with new requirements until they are either amended or replaced. Conflicting ordinances are uh, null and void, in which case the government code, I will only say this one, 65852.2, uh, <laughs> governs. <laughs> I've been saying it a lot at the counter. So what does this mean for the city of Capitola? As I mentioned, uh, the city of Capitola's existing ADU ordinance is not consistent with the new state law, therefore it is null and void. ADU applications in the city will be reviewed and adopted under that government code section until the city of Capitola adopts an ordinance that complies with that code section. The draft ordinance will be presented at the next planning commission meeting on February 6th. The new legislation is not very easy to comprehend. I joked to Katie that I should have the, our draft ordinance and the state law because I've been carrying them in my pockets for the last <laughs> month and a half. Um, we originally intended to have that ordinance before you tonight. However, um, due to the complexity of the new laws, we are working through a few more questions that have arisen uh, so that we can bring forward a draft that we really feel confident in uh, that it complies with state law. There are several general ADU standards that have changed. Uh, jurisdictions must allow ADUs in areas zoned to allow residential uses and may only restrict location based on adequacy of water and sewer, impact of ADU on traffic flow, and public safety. Owner occupancy requirements are only permitted for junior ADUs. Uh, this is the only provision of the new law that sunsets in 2025, uh, which means that the city could require owner occupancy for all ADUs again after that point, but any un units built between 2020 and 2025 uh, will remain exempt. Jurisdictions may prohibit rentals of less than 30 days in all ADUs and must prohibit short-term rentals in ADUs approved under the limited standards, which I'm gonna describe later. Uh, our draft ordinance, as a matter of fact, does go with that first one and restricts them in to 30 days in all ADUs, which you'll, you'll see next, next week. Is that in your package right here? Um, Jurisdictions may also allow the separate sale or conveyance of an ADU from a primary res residence if it was constructed by a qualified nonprofit organization under AB 587. This part is optional and will be raised as a discussion point in the staff report for the next meeting. Does that require a lot split? We How are just getting into that today. How do you discussion sell a separate <laughs> ADU? Yeah. I mean, it, I assume it would essentially be like a condo conversion of a lot, but. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out is that the owner occupancy requirements for those ADUs that are in place and have owner occupancy requirements, they continue to apply. So 
they can't now just rent out both units. The owner occupancy stands within the deed restriction. Yeah, we'll actually get into that next next month as well on a separate project, 511 Escalona, which was approved with one, didn't re record those deed restrictions yet, and one's going to be bringing it back s so that they don't have but that we requirement. Me so. We might, or the city council might want to decide to make them all uniform. Mm -hmm. mm. there's, a, there's a few items like that, so we'll, <laughs> including a very important one, parking. Um, so anyway. Uh, there are general requirements in the law that are applicable uh, to limited standard ADUs only, including uh, jurisdictions may not require correction of non-conforming zoning conditions as a condition of approval. No fire sprinklers may be required unless they are required in the primary residence. Um, we must, as I mentioned a second ago, we must require rental term longer than 30 days, which we look at as a small win for jurisdictions that we weren't expecting. Uh, we may require percolation tests uh, within five years or ten years if the test has been recertified as a condition to add an ADU to an on-site water treatment system. I, I included all this stuff. Some of these are really going to be very few and far between or maybe not relevant at all, but I, I wanted you to have all the information here. Uh, ordinances permitting ADUs in multifamily buildings that were adopted before July 1st, 2018 may enforce design, development, and historic standards on ADUs in multifamily buildings. Uh, this actually wouldn't apply to us because ours did not do that. <clears throat> and last but not least, and this is a big one, all standards, including maximum floor area, must be waived to permit at least an 800 square foot ADU, 16 feet in height, with four foot side and rear yard setbacks. So to elaborate on that, if you have a home that's built out for its FAR, they, we think we should get rid of our FAR incentive of the 0.6 FAR because at this point, any home that's maxed out can come in for an additional 800 square feet. Yeah, that, what, what is to force them to treat it as an ADU as opposed to an addition to their house? With a kitchen. Yeah. Th yeah. Which that's we are already it. seeing. Yeah. But it doesn't even, even if we do get rid of our FAR, they still have the right to do this, right? Mm -hmm. So right. it doesn't really make a difference if... Well, then they'd have the increased FAR and they'd get the 800 on top. So that's why the 60%, because, for example, a lot of the larger lots do this where they go from 48% to 60% max FAR. So they would get to 60% and get another 800 square feet on top of that. So it'd be a huge bonus for larger lots in particular in the city. And since right. we're already getting an 800 square feet over... So if you have an attached ADU, you have to have those setbacks up there. What if you have an unattached freestanding ADU? How far is the setback between the existing structure and the ADU? Uh, just adequate for fire safety. So as long as okay. it's fire rated correctly, yeah, you can go as close as you want. Yeah. Okay. The new laws also change the review and approval process. Applications for certain types of ADUs must be reviewed and approved ministerially with no discretionary review or public hearings if they meet minimum standards, which I will describe on a later slide. These will be referred to, referred to in the ordinance as limited standards ADUs, and those include internal ADUs, which are ADUs converted from existing structures, uh, which include primary residences, attached and detached garages, and any accessory structure, even if the structure is non-conforming. Detached ADUs on single-family parcels, including detached ADUs paired with a junior ADU and a primary single-family residence, so essentially a triplex. Internal ADUs in non-livable multifamily spaces, such as storage rooms, boiler rooms, passageways, attics, basements, or garages. And detached ADUs on multifamily parcels. The time to act on permit application has also been reduced to 60 days from 120 days unless the application is concurrent with an application to build a new single family dwelling. If a complete application is not acted upon within 60 days, it's kind of like a subdivision map act thing, it shall be deemed approved. Hmm. I'm going to review three types of ADUs in the following slides. Limited standards, which I just mentioned, full standards, and then the ADUs that are actually subject to design permits and conditional use permits. The first type I will review uh, is the ADU that is subject to limited standards. There are two types of ADUs that must be reviewed and approved under limited standards on single family lots. And so the first one is uh, one ADU or junior ADU within an existing or proposed single family unit or accessory structure. 
an expansion of up to 150 square feet is permitted, but only for ingress or egress. Or ingress I interrupt egress. For, what's yeah. a junior ADU as opposed to an ADU? So a junior ADU is actually a, it's 65852.22 <laughs> in the government code. Uh, restricted to 500 square feet, um, still has the owner occupancy requirements, uh, and it has some other very specific requirements related internal to internal access. Yeah. I believe it, it has to maintain internal, internal access. At least it used to. Yeah. It doesn't have to have its own bathroom. It can yeah. technically like okay. share a bathroom with the primary resident. It's it's just a very specific type of, of conversion ADU. Like a one room studio. Yeah, within yeah. the house that has. I think it can have interior and exterior access. Mm -hmm. so. Um, yeah, so exterior access is required and setbacks must be sufficient for fire safety. Uh, the other type on single family lots is one new construction detached ADU on lots with an existing or proposed single family unit. Uh, those uh, cannot be more than 800 square feet, not more than 16 feet in height, and ha must have four foot side and rear setbacks. Uh, this, this is the one type of uh, ADU that may be combined with a junior ADU uh, to make the triplex setup. I had a question. Yeah. With the the sixteen foot height limit and the not more than eight hundred square foot, um, I've been hearing in different sections like Santa Fe City mm -hmm. that if you can't get instead of filling the entire backyard, say on like a substandard lot, they would they would encourage you to then stack, you know, a two story to you mm -hmm. and then their height limit went up to I think twenty twenty two feet. But I'm just I'm wondering how you guys plan I mean well so our any two story in ours is going to be a discretionary one that's going to require design permit and conditional use permit mm -hmm. you, you're allowed to be more permissive with your codes and I look through Santa Cruz's as well I'm not sure um, it's it's definitely more permissive they actually went with three feet instead of four um, and, and I think there's some other areas where they went a little more permissive as well uh, and so you are welcome you know the city of the Capitol is welcome to do something similar if they'd like um, but we at the moment are just going with exactly what the state law said mm -hmm. so okay. but our, our draft I think you can go up to 24 feet but it does require design permit and CUP oh it does mm -hmm. uh, there are also two types of ADUs that have to be reviewed and approved under limited standards for multifamily lots uh, multi multiple ADUs within an existing multifamily building these must be converted from space not used as livable space. These are the ones I mentioned before for storage rooms, boiler rooms, passageways, that types of thing. Um, but they do have to meet building code standards. Uh, with these, local jurisdictions must allow 25% of the existing units in the building or one unit, whichever is greater. So for example, a multifamily building with 12 units could have three of these conversion ADUs if they had happen to have a storage room, boiler room, and a garage that could be converted. Um, we would have to approve that. Uh, and then not more than two detached ADUs on lots with existing multifamily units. Um, so these have to be detached from the existing multifamily building. Um, and then they have the same 16 foot height, four foot uh, side and rear setback requirements. Could that include a carport? Uh, yes. Okay, so next up is the ADU subject to the full review standards. Uh, there are also new standards that must be applied to uh, additions and new detached ADUs that do not qualify for ministerial approval under the limited standard section that I just reviewed. This category would be limited to one-story attached ADUs and detached ADUs between 800 and 1,200 square feet, so pretty narrow uh, category here. Applications for these types of ADUs will be reviewed and approved administratively under standards very similar to the limited standard ADUs. Uh, with these, uh, local jurisdictions are expressly allowed to regulate parking, but with a very large asterisk there, um, because there are major exceptions that I'm going to address in just a couple minutes here. Height, landscape, architectural review, maximum unit size, and uh, standards that prevent adverse impacts on any real property listed in the California Register of Historic Places. Uh, local jurisdictions are also prohibited from enforcing minimum lot size requirements. Um, as I mentioned earlier, no setbacks uh, requ are required for conversions of existing structures, even if they're non-conforming. And then there's a couple of minimum and maximum size uh, requirements permitted. The minimum size must at least allow an efficiency unit of 150 square feet. And then uh, there's two different maximums uh, in terms of one bedroom and two bedroom. One bedroom maximum has to be, you have to let the, someone have at least 850 
for a one bedroom or a thousand square feet for a two bedroom. Uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, while the new state law mentions that we have the ability to require parking, uh, it also exempts most ADUs from parking requirements. No parking spaces can be required for internal, so those are the conversion ones, uh, junior ADUs or attached ADUs. In addition, no parking spaces can be required if the ADU is located within half mile walking distance of public transit, uh, it's located within a national register historic district or other historic district officially designated by the city council, um, or if the ADU is part of a proposed or existing primary residence or accessory structure. Uh, when on-street parking, on parking permits are required but not offered to the occupant of the ADU, and when there is a car share vehicle pickup drop-off location within one block of the ADU. So, as a result of those exemptions, the City of Capitola can only require parking spaces for detached ADUs, and only if none of those exemptions on the previous slide apply. However, the very first one of those exemptions, the one-half mile of, of public transit, uh, exempts most of the city from parking requirements as shown here. The area in gray on the right, including Clif the Clifford Heights neighborhood, is the only area where the city could actually require parking for detached ADUs. So the ones that need it the least. <laughs> the only place where there is parking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> however, really wide streets. Yeah. Uh, however, there are several bus stops along Park Avenue that are currently inactive and not included in the previous map. If that bus route were to be made active, all types of ADUs on every parcel in the city of Capitola would be exempt from parking requirements. Given the fact that all types of ADUs will be exempt from parking requirements in the majority and potentially all of Capitola, the Planning Commission may want to consider removing all parking requirements from the ordinance. Um, so we can discuss that at the next meeting. This flowchart uh, shows how each ADU type would move through the approval process. Um, this is um, still being worked on and we're still working on what types of applications and, and all that good stuff, but um, this, this is the basics. The limited standard ADUs uh, would submit an application. The city has a 60-day planning and building review timetable to work with. Uh, we can only apply those limited standards, so the 800 square foot um, square footage, um, 16 foot height, four foot rear and side setbacks, that's it. We can't apply anything else. Um, uh, they are, however, subject to the general requirements for all ADUs, which is a very small category. Uh, and then it's a mandatory approval. The full review standards, submit an application, same 60-day planning and review uh, timetable, also subject to the general requirements, uh, but then we also are allowed to um, subject them to the development standards and objective standards that you'll see in the ordinance that comes out next week uh, that do give us a little more to work with. And then there's approval. Uh, and then the ones that are, s that are actually going to come to you for a design permit and a conditional use permit, they submit an application. We have a 60-day review uh, unless they are submitted with application for a new single-family dwelling, at which point they're on the timetable for that single-family dwelling working its way through our design process. Um, those are also subject to general requirements for all ADUs, but are also subject to the full development standards, the objective design standards, and then um, some of them may be asking for deviations from standards, and we, we are gonna have a section there that has specific findings that need to be made by you uh, to approve those. There are also changes related to fees that can be charged by the local jurisdiction, but they mainly uh, relate to impact fees and utility connections. Since the city of Capitola does not charge impact fees and is not a utility, these changes do not really affect us. Um, Local jurisdictions are authorized to charge fees to reimburse for costs incurred to implement the new state law, for example, the countless hours I have spent on this, um, including the cost to adopt and amend the ADU ordinance. Matt, so uh, my understanding was, uh, so if you're on um, a city a city water permit process, but because we're with a special district with Soquel, mm -hmm. they don't have to, they can still charge a permit fee? I know they are um, consulting with their attorneys on this as well, and the guidance that, that they have provided us for 2020 um, has meter fees for all new construction ADUs, but not for conversion ADUs. So I, you know, I, they're gonna handle it in the way that they see fit. Um, so that, that's how they're proceeding through 2020, and we'll see how it goes. And the other portion of our city that's under Santa Cruz water? Right is there's no 
They won't charge a fee. They won't charge the fee. Yeah, yeah, that was my understanding, but the district could still charge a fee. <laughs> You'll see. This <laughs> the, the state law is very uh, prescriptive as to what they can do, and so it'll be interesting to see whether that holds up. <laughs> Uh, there are a couple of other random ADU changes. Um, the junior ADU standards were relaxed. Uh, for example, it used to rec uh, in junior ADU used to have to uh, include a bedroom that was converted out of the main house. That has been taken away, so they changed just a little bit. Uh, AB 670, I got a text about this tonight from a buddy actually about whether um, HOAs could still prohibit these, and the answer to that is no. AB 670 voids CCNRs that prohibit and unreasonably uh, restrict ADUs or junior ADUs. AB 671 requires local governments to include a plan in their housing element to incentivize and promote the creation of ADUs that can be offered at an affordable rate for very low, low, and moderate income households. Uh, jurisdictions may count ADUs in their housing elements, and uh, I, it sounds like HUD will be giving us guidelines on those. So in terms of next steps, uh, the draft ordinance will be presented to you at the next regular meeting on February 6th. Once the Planning Commission has approved the draft ordinance, it must be reviewed and adopted by the City Council. After that, it must be sent to the HCD uh, within 60 days of adoption. They may submit written findings regarding compliance with uh, Code 6585 2.2. If HCD finds that our ordinance is inconsistent with that government code, uh, we have to either amend our ordinance or adopt the ordinance without changes, but include findings uh, stating why we think it complies with government section government code section. And then uh, just another note, ADU ordinance updates are exempt from CEQA. So take a little time. And sorry, that's it. I have it. a question. Yes. In the dual box area where most of the lots are 40 by 80, mm -hmm. the city in the past, and I, I, I don't think this is an ordinance, but they've always discouraged or prohibited a second curb cut. So if you were to put an ADU on your property, would you be allowed a second curb cut to provide off-street parking? I don't believe so, because our, our driveway width section is actually in Chapter 12. Th so the state law doesn't address that, and there's a limitation is in our code that has to be no more than 16 feet or 40% of the lot width. So I, I don't – that wouldn't allow any of those to have a second curb cut, because that would – most of their frontage. So, so before we get too far into the weeds on kind of the, uh, many, many uh, specific issues we could look at and talk about and probably be here for hours, I kind of want to get a sense of where we're going mm -hmm. with this. So the state has enacted some statutes that are very complicated and very comprehensive about all sorts of rules that uh, apply to ADUs. And so we're jumping on this because there's a default statute in effect right now, the state law. We're jumping on this to create our own revised ordinance. And I guess my question is, before we just come back and have another hearing, this, this is so complicated, what are, what are our objectives? What are we trying to accomplish here? How are we going to do it? What is the, is the process of just having another hearing on February 3rd and then going to the city council? adequate what I, i'd like staff's thoughts on that sure um so we've seen many jurisdictions move forward with emergency ordinances in talking with our attorney uh, we really wanted to work and rework our ordinance until we felt confident that it was in compliance with state code our our objective here is really we need to draft an ordinance that meets the requirements of the state but at the same time protects Capitola to, to what we understand our residents. Um, so where does that come from? Right. For example, the city of Santa Cruz apparently has uh, adopted some more liberal standards in favor of trying to expand public housing. And are we saying that we know that the city of Capitola does not want to go that direction and wants to try to fight the concept as much as it can and minimize its uh, compliance with the state law? Or are we saying we want to expand our compliance with the state law? And where does this come from? Who voted on it? And um, so what we were, our plan was at the next hearing to bring forth a, a, the draft ordinance and talk about those areas where we have flexibility to make those decisions um, of 
of whether or not like for the tonight we introduced the parking standard and we have the ability to just waive all parking for ADUs because you know depending on just that where and so hopefully in getting the word out on ADUs it's a bit disappointing that we don't have we've had so Matt Matt and Sean have probably it's not one question on ADUs a day that they're getting it's multiple so they're you know people are well informed that this is happening um, we can try to get the word more out there for the next public hearing so that hopefully people will weigh in um, we know exactly where the state stands and how how they'd like it addressed in the past um, Right now, it feels like we need to get something in place, but at the same point, no, we haven't gone out to the public and asked the difficult questions of do we want to make it as you know as tight as possible, but in compliance with the state, or should we be loosening this so that we can move forward with? Peter, Peter wants to weigh in here. Yeah, so uh, I had the the same concern, and to me, it seems like I would want the city council to weigh in as as to are we going Santa Cruz route or are we going the you know, minimal look for any loopholes route? Mm -hmm. uh, because you know, when you mentioned the two foot setback or the three foot setback w you know, and, the, and the requirement is four, it's like, well, okay. I mean, there is, there is a political statement here that says we want m more affordable housing. We wanna, we wanna solve this problem. And so Santa Cruz, I guess, is going in with both feet and they wanna really help, help out and, and you know, based on that limited information that you just gave us. So my question would be, well, as a commissioner, I am not an elected official, which somebody guide me. Are we, am I going through here looking for loopholes because I, I started to, or am I being guided the other direction? No, let's, let's, let's help these, you know, people out and, and find more affordable housing. And I, I don't feel I, well, unless we wanted to provide a recommendation to the city council say here's what the city here's what the planning commission thinks and then they could argue that but i, I think the, the there's a big question which is well yeah what's what's our direction here are we are we are we all for this or are we fighting it well i think so to some extent that's our role is to make a recommendation to city council we as planning commissioners spend a lot more time in the weeds with this type of stuff than they do as city council the political side's gonna come out once it gets to the city council. Um, I, I don't know, yeah, I, I understand. Is someone directing us? I see that as our role, just to kind of set a path and we this is our chance to have a voice. And I think the people that I've talked to about these ADU things coming in is, it's gonna be a huge impact in, in Capitola, Santa Cruz, wherever. But um, when you take into account what we're listening to tonight, traffic, parking, uh, and just uh, the small high density that areas that we already have, it's gonna be a big impact to our cities potentially. <coughs> I could easily have a triplex at my house and so could all my neighbors. And so you add all those cars into this into the mix and is that really where we go with the general plan that was chaired by Commissioner Newman there is, is is that we're trying to keep this quaint town the way, it, and I don't know if that really fits in. I think it's gonna, to me, I think what comes to us forced upon us by the state, it's gonna force us to allow more housing by default, but I'm of the mindset to try to minimize it. And, um, you know, I was appointed, like you said, we're not elected, but the elected officials are finally, they're gonna take either our recommendations and say, no, we see it differently. We want to make it inclusive to anybody who wants to come to Capitola. So, well, so is there going to be a city council meeting before uh, you come back to us on the February? Mm -hmm. so, so this is a great opportunity. We're actually taking it next week to this update to the city council and the staff report gets released tomorrow. And I can ask for direction. Well, or, or can we can provide that direct. We can have a yeah. vote here and say, here's what the city, Are you, you know. taking the same thing that you just presented to us to the city council for input before it comes back to us? Yes. Okay, so that I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. That's, that is, I think, yeah, I, we need to have big picture direction here before we can start dealing with every, and it might be some are different. We might, for example, feel that Parking requirements need to be as tight as possible for purposes of Capitola, but owner-occupied, maybe we, we're willing to 
We don't think that's a big issue. And we need to kind of take them one at a time mm -hmm. here and we have an idea of what the policy, what our policy should be as a city before we talk about all the details. Yeah, so I think what TJ is saying is that should that come from bottom up or top down? And well, all, all the I know is w we, and, and when I talk with the city council, m council members that I have interaction with, we have a lot more insight to the codes and where we're at today than they see, many of them I think see themselves at that political level. And maybe they want to jump on the bandwagon and says, yeah, everybody, we should make it as inclusive as we can to make as many homes as we can in Capitola. That may be the political stance, but I think from uh, my perspective of a, as a planning commissioner is to know our codes and all the ins and outs of our intent of our general plan and how we, because the general plan pretty much drives our codes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if, if that's true, then we kind of have some insight to where we want to go with this. But this but is new since our, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, this is, no, it changes the whole, I agree. It's a game changer. And, <laughs> and I'll tell you right now, I was going to say for commissioner comments, but I won't be here for the February meeting, so. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, so I think, like, to think about it as two tiers, to now in the city of Capitola, if you have a single, a lot with a single family on it, or can be developed with a single family, or a lot with multifamily, they're allowed to have an ADU. And we have a required, we're gonna be required to approve that within 60 days. Okay, so um, the second tier is how we're going to review these ADUs. And that, that will be this, what we're gonna need guidance on. So the required four foot setback from side and rear lot lines, if that doesn't make practical sense and we want people to have more flexibility of maybe it'd be better to have the ADU closer to the property line so there's we save backyards and they're more usable then that you know th these are things that we'll be asking for guidance on um, but as far as the allowance of the ADU they're going to be allowed at least one on multi-families the standards are much higher with the up to 25 percent so I think yeah, but, uh, but uh, the, like the specific example you brought up, I mean, mm -hmm. we could conceivably, or you could ministerially, since we probably won't have a, 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 a say in it, ministerially say, no, this, is a, this ADU is, is disapproved because you, there's no way you can put a four-foot setback in here. Therefore, disapproved. As opposed to, oh, no, I know the city council and the planning commission really wants to encourage these. Mm -hmm. We're going to go ahead and allow the two-foot setback. And I think you need guidance on that, and I think we need to provide it, or someone needs to and provide it. Just for clarity, under the code, um, the way that it was written by the state, if if they can't meet those setbacks, is that w out of the? Um, yeah, they can ask for, a but we'll get into all of that. But there's, um, but it, yeah, for an 800 square foot unit up to 16 feet with four foot setbacks, but they can move forward for a deviation for that. But, but it also commission. allows it if they already have a non-conforming to enlarge yeah. the non-conforming. Yeah. And yeah. think of how many non-conforming we, I mean, our whole city's basically yeah. non-conforming today. So yeah, it's, it's a big But if they apply for this too, if they apply for a deviation, and again, this is gonna be handled ministerially and not, and not come to the planning commission. The deviations are you going would come to you. Deviations will come to you. Okay. So I also think that they put a lot of pressure on us in terms of the timing of this. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the staff for sure. it's it, yeah, and the staff yeah. especially, and it's in effect automatically I, I, unless you you can enact some ordinances to, to tweak it. But uh, in the meantime, we've got, we've got a law for you here, so that's fine. But uh, it puts a, I mean, I, We've w we have enough trouble with our ordinance so we keep uh, finding errors and amending and here we're going to on a rush basis in the next meeting already be enacting what's, what seems to me like a complete game changer in Capitola. It is. Well, it is. And, and do you have any insight to other places? How many people are rushing to the door to, to have ADUs? Is it, are people jumping on the bandwagon to add ADUs in other districts that are, our districts really haven't adopted it yet because it's so new it just started in january well it d doesn't matter if they've adopted it but I, I so my impression is they're you know rushing every and every how many applications have we had so far in the first two weeks of january we had one on january 2nd which you're going to see next month um that's actually one that you guys had already approved and um, that's like i said it's coming back just because they it's not have the deed restriction basically um and then i, I multiple a day 
I think um, we're going to see more conversions oh, in the absolutely. duplex. Wait, than so new. for clarification, yeah. multiple inquiries a day? I don't yeah, think no, you've in received. In terms of the actual applications, yeah. we only had that one. The one. Because they, they were waiting for that to pass so that on January 2nd they could come in and apply. So, um, But there, there will be many more soon. <laughs> I've been hearing um, some type of, it's a sentiment of entitlement of mm -hmm. people saying like, I'm, I'm allowed to have up to 800 square feet in mm -hmm. regardless of what, whatever jurisdiction puts limitations of saying you can have, you know, a three foot setback, two foot setback, but they're allowed to argue the point of mm -hmm. saying that if I can, if I'm allowed to have 800 square foot feet back here, I can push it up to the property line mm -hmm. and they're heard. Do you, is that, is that being legitimate? No. No. Not quite up to the property line. With a deviation, you could. Um, I think, I think one property. thing to be prepared for is um, applicants that recently got approvals and they were, you know, the maximum ADU size has gone up. If, if it's a two bedroom, it can go up to 1,200 square feet. So there's, we may be seeing more, you know, revisiting recent approvals that were going through the building permit process at this point but haven't built yet but really wanted a larger ADU, that's another thing. So it may be a, a good way to go about this would be to adopt an ordinance just to have it in place and then come back and work through. Well, Ben must this. be doing like a standard ordinance for, Oh yeah. If yeah. he has tons of clients who are, I mean, for, the, for example, the ownership requirement is, that's a new ball game too. And I would like to take a close look at that and see how we deal with pre-existing and just, you know, all these different components of just that one issue. Mm -hmm. So that, that controversial one in Cliffwood Heights that we had, the second story edition, mm -hmm. all that controversy is for it's nothing, it's right? Yeah. For nothing, yeah. yeah. If, that, if that came in at 800 square feet. Yeah, it's automatic. It's automatic, yeah. Okay, so just to try to get some order, post some order on this, I don't know if I can. I mean, we've what? got a, well, wow. I've got a can few I just other make questions. Okay, <laughs> good. I don't know if we were at a question yet. It's not a question it's portion of the meeting yet. <laughs> Reform. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at some of this stuff, and, and uh, it talks about the Coastal Commission. They can't violate the Coastal Commission Act 1976. So if we were to get the Coastal Commission to approve our zoning code, does that give us an out on this whole thing? <laughs> because the Coastal Commission, they have, they're not a local entity. They're a state entity. They approved our co zoning code in, in most of the cities. Therefore, no, I mean don't it's they have to it approve it all our ADUs and all our changes? Mm -hmm. It's in effect, and uh, as far as Coastal Commission, there's no public meeting required. So if we were to issue a coastal development permit, if, if, if it required a coastal development permit under, um, if it just met the requirements for a CDP, it would be an administrative CDP that we would issue. So. It's because it's in effect, we would just, I as the community development director would, re we would review it administratively and I would make, if I could make the findings for a coastal development permit, they would get their admin permit as well as their CDP, but we can't require. Does it require an amendment to the LCP? It does, so we'll be submitting a, a amendment to the LCP immediately. And then the Coastal Commission is gonna have to approve it because they're. Oh, they're gonna be bombarded with. Yeah. <laughs> ADU ordinances this yeah. year, so. Oh, wow. Yeah. But I don't see where it violates any, I mean, it, it doesn't go against any of their uh, I was looking for loopholes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, housing in the coastal zone is a, is a value for the Coastal Commission. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we don't care about that. The, the other loophole I was wondering is that I also read in there about uh, water adequacy, that you're allowed to deny this if there's a there's a water sh water or sewage, I think it is the words that was mentioned in there. And clearly we have a, a water shortage here in this uh, SoCal Water Creek district. That's At referring to the availability of services though, not not that if there's a water crisis, it just means like if you don't have water lines or sewer lines available to a property, oh, then that's you can use that as a finding for not approving it, yeah. Oh, that's too bad. Um, yeah, I thought there was a density loophole as well, but I'm sure they've got all those blocked. Um, it's a little interesting that they make a, a comment about density, saying this, this can't exceed the proposed density, when yeah. by nature of what this is, you're exceeding what we've established as our yeah, maximum so that, density. I was confused so. about that as well. <laughs> so uh, is this whole thing expire in five years? No, only that one clause about uh, owner occupancy of junior ADUs. Oh. Yeah. 
just to <laughs> make it more complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have till July 1st to submit, otherwise we're in violation of, I thought it was a July 1st, 2018 deadline to submit a draft of our ordinance. No, no that, that was referring to the multifamily. If you, if you had already <laughs> had a multifamily <laughs> ordinance in place at that point that allowed ADUs with multifamily buildings, then you could have still apply design standards and things like that that you had in place at the time. We didn't have anything in place at that time, so that's why I mentioned that that didn't apply to us. Uh, there's no deadline in this because it's already law. I mean, we're, we're functioning under it right now. If an application came in today, we'd be treating it, accepting it, and moving forward with it under this. So in, in that way, there's actually not a rush because this is already law. Um, I think the rush is just we would like to have something you know, together that's our interpretation of this that we can move forward to you and city council. And, and then, as you mentioned, you know, take public direction on, on how we want to tweak it to allow a little bit more, have it be more restrictive. You know, that's, that's, we can't do that until we have some sort of a draft in place. And so that's, well, that's I what we've been I think at the uh, city council <coughs> hearing next week, uh, the staff can present the planning commission concerns about direction here and how this should be handled as well as just the details of the ordinance and so forth and kind of get some input from them as to how uh, they think this should progress with the understanding that this, at least in the opinion of most of the people up here, is a very, very big uh, deal mm -hmm. for Capitola. It may be something we can't do much about, or, but, but still, I, I, there are at least some aspects of it that we can uh, address and to, we need to know what direction we're going. Then we can come back. I'm not sure that February 3rd mm -hmm. is the time to have uh, the, the vote and ordinance up or down. Mm -hmm. it, we can continue. It's February 6th, mm -hmm. but we can continue it. You know, we'll be asking for direction that night just be, um, with all the inquiries that come through the desk if, as just uh, to provide that service to our residents with to have an ordinance in place. But if it takes, if, if we need more time, but we'll, I'll definitely be asking the questions of city council next week in terms of how do we want it to be more lenient than the state? I mean, that's the only option. It can't be tighter than what the state's written, so. So although it's very complicated, is it is it also very precise and prescriptive like you, you pointed out? So. There's not a lot of wiggle room in terms of, well, this needs to be interpreted and that needs to be interpreted. And so you're looking, you as staff is looking for guidance in, in that interpretation. It's very precise. We could loosen the, you know, like the setbacks or the height, but it's, it's extremely precise in creating um, how the avenues for how you need to treat individual situations. But if you said, you know, let's treat them all the same and they all get a fast track and limited review then that would be a little more lenient. But it, it is, it, it's confusing, it's not well written. Um, but once you get into the exact, it, it seems very prescriptive and precise. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and the state's really moving towards objective standards for all, for housing. So you're, you're gonna hear more and more of that where we can't have these compatibility reviews and even with the ADU ordinance and how it's going to affect like a historic structure with an ADU addition we're proposing we can put objective standards in there to try to guide it towards the Secretary of Interior standards and what you know in addition to a historic would be but it can't you know we can't call it up for a conditional use permit a design permit it's going to be an administrative review so that's one area that we're we've written objective standards into the code to try to be consistent with the way it's been applied in the past. But, but yeah, we'll come back with guidance, hopefully. The other thing is if, Planner Employment Act. Yeah. <laughs> if we, yeah, it is. Except we can't it bill is. for any of this. <laughs> if, if we're gonna have a full-on ordinance draft uh, to deal with at a meeting, it would be really great if we could get it a little more in advance than we get our packets. Mm -hmm maybe have more time so the the packet will go out in two weeks actually and so we could try to get the um, the ordinance out possibly by next Friday so you have a whole week in advance to start looking at as soon as we uh, we're just working out some of the last details of it but it's pretty well baked at this point so we'll get it to you right. early okay anything further on this uh, <laughs> subject uh, <laughs> 
Okay, director's report. Um, I, I don't have a director's report. As you know, the wharf is open again. It was closed for a while there um, due to a couple pilings, and um, but it's open again, and no director's report this evening. Any commission communications? I, I had two questions. One about uh, OSH, which is now yeah. Outdoor Supply and Hardware. Mm -hmm. do, do we know when that's going to They're open. It's open. already open? Oh, yeah. yeah. For two weeks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> behind the times. Yeah. You don't come over um, to West Side Capitola enough. <laughs> no, uh, unfortunately, I'm too used to going to Home Depot. But uh, Then secondly, Coastal Commission, anything with Coastal Commission and Santa Cruz just had, did they come to an agreement in Santa Cruz? They're close. Um, I'm meeting with their community development director next week. They're going to have their final revisions, so hoping to bring you some information on that at the next meeting. But... Um, they're, they've got to go back to the Board of Supervisors, get their approval on the most recent changes, and then take it back to Coastal Commission for final edit, for final approval. And my last comment yeah. is I, I work with the next meeting, so. Uh, oh. Okay. All right, so if there's nothing further, we'll adjourn until uh, Groundhog Day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>